Have you ever had this thought? I really want to be used by God to do something that matters. I'm just so messed up, I don't know if that's actually possible. You ever had that thought? You ever had the thoughts like, God, I, I want to be significant. I want, I, want, I want real purpose in my life. I want you to use me like to make a difference in somebody's life. I, I want to have a real proud funeral. Have you ever, I know it's a morbid thought. Some, have you ever thought like, I want to have a funeral where people are like lining up to get a microphone to go, he actually changed my life, and I want to tell you how? She changed my life, and I want to tell you how. Have you ever thought like, God, would you use me in that kind of capacity? But then your very next thought is like, but who am I kidding? I'm just me. And I might be too broken for something like that. I mean, we can be honest in church. Have you ever had those feelings? Listen, if you have, I'm telling you, today is for you. I don't know if this is a good title, but it's a great announcement. And it is this. God uses broken people. Hey, somebody put that in the chat. I want you to type it out because I want you to see it. I want you to say it. In fact, if you're in a building, tell somebody, God uses broken people. I want you to hear yourself say those words. God uses broken people. Hey, church, if we can get this in our spirit today, I'm telling you, it's going to change things. It just will. I'll never forget the first time I spoke at a church on a Sunday morning. I was 27 years old. I got saved at 24. I did not grow up in church. I had a drug problem. I was suicidal. I was a wreck when I got saved. I moved to Illinois to be a part of this just to get around some church people, and, and they convinced me to join this intern program. I didn't even really know what it was. About halfway through, I realized it was an intern program to become a pastor. I was like, that's definitely not me, but I kind of kept, I just stayed in the intern program because I was like, I think it's just going to keep me saved, and I need that right now. And I blinked, and my two-year intern program went by, and they gave me a piece of paper that said, you're a pastor. And I was like... I just ran lights for youth for two years. Like, how am I a pastor? Like, this makes no sense. I don't feel like a pastor. And then the senior pastor of this church, it was about a 2,000-person church, did something I still to this day cannot believe. He asked me to speak on the weekend. I was like, this guy's trying to tank the church. He wants out. That's what he wants. Like, and I'm the guy. So, so I, I preached my 27-year-old, been saved two years, heart out. And, and then I did what? Every 27-year-old should do after his first speaking engagement. I got in my car with my friend Chad, and I was driving back to my apartment to go play PlayStation. <laughs> On the way home, I, I, in the middle of an intersection, a guy pulls out in front of me, gives me the finger, and starts saying crazy stuff. And guys, I lost it. I, I back my car up. I pull out in front of him, so I block him so he can't go forward. I get out of my car. I'm in the middle of an intersection wearing a suit that doesn't fit very well. <laughs> We were a suit and tie church, and, and I'm in the middle of the intersection, and I start saying things that I cannot repeat on a Sunday. I start saying crazy things. I'm begging this dude to get out of the car and fight me. And my friend Chad rolls the window down, and he goes, hey, get in the car. And I was like, why? He goes, because you preached about the love of God six minutes ago. I was like... Oh my gosh. You know how sometimes you have those out-of-body experiences and then you go, oh, wait a second. I'm a pastor <laughs> in a small town in the middle of the intersection saying crazy things. I was like, God bless you. <laughs> Got in the car, drove home, played PlayStation. All I could think about was, who am I kidding? Of course I want to do something that matters. Of course I want God to use me to like, I want to make a difference. Of course, we're hardwired for that stuff. But the truth is, I just know how screwed up I am. And who am I kidding? Some of you, it's why you haven't put your faith in Jesus yet. You're checking church out. You're checking this whole God thing out. And you can't get rid of this thought, who am I kidding? He wouldn't want me. Some of you have been saved for more years than you can remember. And you had a bad month. And you're asking the same question. I want to do something that matters, but look, I still, who, right? The apostle Paul knew we would struggle with this stuff. 
In fact, he's talking to his protege and one of his friends named Timothy, who's going to be a pastor, and he's got this huge calling of God on his life. And he says, Timothy, you're going to battle with this stuff. You're going to feel like you're not enough, so let me talk you through this. Let me, let me set you up for success, because until you can get past this thought of I'm not enough to be used by God, you'll never walk in the confidence that God wants you to. You won't experience the plans he has for you. And the worst part is you won't be able to change the world the way he set you up to do so. So he says, you got to get this through your head. So here's where he starts. He said, hey, bro, here's a trustworthy saying. Heads up. This one deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Now, some of you, the, 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 the name, the apostle Paul doesn't mean a whole lot to you. This is a guy who started churches across the known world. One of the most significant Christian men to have ever lived since, the, since men were alive, women were alive. Like this guy was crazy used by God, wrote a huge part of the New Testament of our Bible. And he's sitting here going, I know what it feels like to feel like I might be the worst sinner that there is. How's God going to use me? I think I'm the worst sinner. Guess what, though? But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. He said, Timothy, don't you forget it, and don't you forget to tell everybody you talk to. If God can save me, God can save you. Trust me. And listen, you might be listening to this going, that's good for him, but you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my past. And I think the apostle Paul would go, oh, really? Tell me your mistakes. And then I think he would chuckle and go, that's all you got? Because you don't even have to be a Bible person. To, like, go Google this stuff or go read your Bible. Like the apostle Paul had a past. Like he spent a huge chunk of his life trying to eradicate the Christian faith from the planet. He would watch Christians get murdered and cheer for it. He would go pull men, women, and children out of their homes if they said they believed in Jesus and have them abused and arrested and hopefully murdered. Like That's what he made his life about. That was his goal in life. Unless you've done that this week, you're going to have a hard time beating this guy. It's why he says, I think God chose me because I was so screwed up, because he wants you to know if God can save me, God can save you. Can some, some of you need to let the creator of the universe speak to you right now because you got this thing inside you going, I think I need God, but I don't think he would want me. And can you just hear the God of the universe say this to you? Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that includes some of you watching this right now. And I'm going to give you a chance to make the best decision you've ever made in your life before this service is over. Yes. This is for all of us. Paul says, Timothy, it's not just if he can save me, he can save you. He says, bro, if God can use me, God can use you. And this is what God wants to say to us today. Paul says this, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength. Oh, I'm, I'm weak. It's God who strengthens me. He considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. He chose me, even though I just told you how screwed up I was. He chose me. Even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, he said, dude, I, I publicly said, I don't believe Jesus is the son of God. I told everybody who would listen, and I tried to kill anybody who disagreed, and I was mean. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Here it is. What, what we've been talking about throughout this whole series, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. He says this to some friends in, in Galatia, for you've heard my previous way of life in Judaism, how I intensely persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. He keeps telling everybody he talks to about his past. Why? Because he wants everybody he talks to to understand your past has nothing to do with your, with your present and the plans God has for your future, other than he's going to use it for your benefit. We're going to see that in a minute. But he's like, you, you don't have a past that God can't use. You don't have a past that God can't redeem. There isn't a past he can't forgive. He says, you got to get past that. Put that stuff behind you. Trust me, if he can use me with my past, he can use you with your past. Right? But, 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 but for us, here, here, here's what I think. I don't, I don't know about you, but I read stuff like that and I go, 
I believe God's forgiven my past. I do. I believe that. One of my biggest problems is, is I'm still not that good in the present. Right? I know he's forgiven me. I know he loves me. But like, I want to do something that matters with my life. And how am I going to do that when I'm still this screwed up? Paul says, let's talk about it. I know that all God's commands are spiritual. Paul says, let me tell you about my life, just just so God can speak to you about yours. I know all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. He wrote part of the Bible, guys. He said, there's there's so many days when I'm like, I, I feel like God wants me to be so much more spiritual than I am, and I'm just not. He says, isn't this also your experience? You ever felt that? Ever felt like here's like the God way of doing things, and then here's somehow my way of doing things, and so how's he going to use me? He says, yeah, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. We know this feeling. Listen to this. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, and I do things that I absolutely despise. He goes, Timothy, Red Rocks Church. God's got a plan for your life. He wants to use you in some some significant ways. He wants to use you in Ephesians 3.20 ways, ways that are going to blow you out of the water, ways you haven't even asked, thought, or imagined yet. But you've got to get past this thing that says, if I'm not good enough, I can't be used. He goes, trust me, I deal with this all the time. I never feel spiritual enough. I always feel like I'm the worst sinner. I say, God, I'll never do that again, and then I do it again. God, I won't look at that again, and I look at it again. God, I won't treat people that way, and then I treat people that way again. God, I'm going to start better habits, and I'm going to be more, and then I don't. He's like, I know that feeling. And he says, so will you. You'll know that feeling. So what do we do? Because the feelings are real. I want to be used by God, and I feel really inadequate, and they're both happening at the same time. So now what? He says, here's the answer, guys. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Listen, listen, Timothy, it's not because of anything you have done, but because of his own purpose and his grace. What do I do with the feelings that say I'm not good enough? I got to decide to let the word of God trump my feelings. And I got to realize it's not about my goodness. It's about my God's grace. And he calls me anyways. And then we start walking with some confidence. Now, this series is, is called Right Side Up. And we've said every week that the reason we called it that is because a lot of people have said when Jesus came to this world, he came and he kind of flipped things upside down. And we've just said from the beginning, we we just respectfully disagree that if we're going one way and Jesus is going the other, we're probably the upside down ones, not him. And so if he's going to change things, he came to flip things right side up. We have this upside down thinking and every single one of us struggles with this from time to time. And it's exactly what we're talking about today. And it's, I'm just too broken to be used by God. And I think God wants to flip that thing right side up and he wants you to see it so differently. It's not that he's gonna use you in spite of your brokenness. Here's, Here's the right side up thinking. God wants to use me because of my brokenness. That's a whole new way of thinking. See, because here's what, here's what we think. I'm here. The future that God has in store for me and the, the significance and the purpose and the, the ability to help people change, like that's over there. And there's this big pile of all my junk in the middle. So somehow God's got to get me around all this stuff so he can use me. And God knows, no, 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 no. I'm taking you right through the middle of it. Pick up every single thing you've been through because what you've been through is going to help you with what I'm calling you to. It's a whole different way of seeing it. I'm going to use you because of the way you're broken. Listen to what Paul says to his friends in Corinth. He can't stop talking about this stuff because he wants us to start walking with some confidence so we can have churches like this that don't just say we're going to make heaven more crowded. We can actually walk in some confidence and go do it. He says, guys, listen, it's because of the way you've been broken. It's because of what you've been through that God's going to use you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, watch this, who comforts us in all our troubles. Why? So that we can then comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. He says, you're going to struggle. 
because we're broken people in a broken world. I'm not going to waste one struggle. I'm not going to waste one ounce of pain. I'm not going to waste one, one tragic day. I'm going to flip it right side up. And I'm going to get you through it. I'm going to get you through what you're going through right now. And there's going to be a day where you're going to turn around and go, wait, that person's going through what I went through and God helped me so I can help them. Let's go change the world. It's because of what I've been through that makes me better at what God's calling me to. Listen, we see this all throughout the Bible. And, and me and Ryan Weckham, and we came up with a whole bunch. And I'm only going to share three because for time's sake. But like, think about this. And, and Listen, I'm going to say a few names, and if you're new to church and these names don't mean a whole bunch to you, that's okay. You'll still get what I'm talking about. Moses, Moses, his, his mom had to let somebody else raise him because they were killing babies, and so he grows up in Egypt, and uh, someone else raises him, and then he, he, he at one point commits murder, and he kills someone in Egypt, and then, and then he goes into this like period of exile running away, knowing that they want to arrest or kill him because he murdered somebody in Egypt. Like his biggest mistakes in life were in Egypt. Where's God call Moses to go do ministry? Egypt. Imagine the day that God got a hold of Moses and said, I got a whole new plan for your life, and I'm sending you to Egypt. Think about his thoughts. Whoa, 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 I can't go to Egypt. That's where all my mess ups were. That's where my biggest regrets were. That's where my past was that I'm trying to forget. God says, I don't want to forget your past. I want to use your past. We're going to go take that past and turn it into some purpose. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go set some people free. The Apostle Peter, the Apostle Peter, the night Jesus was arrested, makes what I bet if we could talk to him today, he would say the worst mistake of his life, his biggest regrets of his life. Three times he denies Jesus. I don't know him. I've got nothing to do with him. Don't know who he is. Don't want to know who he is. Don't believe in him. I'm out. Biggest mistake he makes. He denies Jesus. Then Jesus dies on a cross, pays the price for our sins, comes back to life, goes and finds Peter, who'd run away from everything, and says, bro, I got a mission for you. I'm going to start the church with you. And he sends them back to the very people that he denied Jesus to. The very people that he was scared to death to say, I'm with Jesus. God calls him to stand up in front of him and say, hey, I know what it feels like to deny Jesus. I know what it feels like to live in this city and not have any clue what to do with this guy named Jesus. But I also know the life change I've experienced through him. And if you repent, you could experience the same thing. 3,000 people get saved and the church gets started. He takes his past and he says, let's go add some purpose to this thing. Because of what you've been through, Peter, you're going to be better at where I'm taking you. It's the Apostle Paul's story. He, he thinks Jesus has so little. He thinks Jesus is such a fraud, such a hoax, such a joke, has so little to do with our lives that he tries killing anybody who puts their faith in him. So what's God do? I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll send you to places like Corinth where everybody thinks Jesus is a joke and nobody thinks Jesus has anything to do with their lives, and people know that you used to kill people who believed in him, we're going to send you to places like that because nobody understands what they're feeling better than you do. So where your biggest regrets were, we're going to send you back to and turn it into your biggest source of ministry. Because of what you've been through, you're going to be better at where I'm taking you. Would you put this, I want, there's a couple phrases I want you to take home with you, and this was something that occurred to me this week, and I was like, I got to start seeing my life this way, and I believe so do you. My, broke, my brokenness is not a list of reasons why God can't use me. It's a resume of all the reasons how he can. See, I, I, I've made a list, and so have you. He can't use me because of this, and he can't use me because of this, and he can't use me because of this. And what if we could begin to actually let this sink into our soul? No, we have a God that redeems our past and all my mistakes and all my pain and all my struggles now become a list of the reasons how he can use me in people's lives because now I'm better. I'm better than anybody else to talk to somebody about that problem because I've been through it. So now all my struggles, it's my resume of how God can use me. I don't have to be ashamed of it because God redeems it. He flips it right side up. I want you to take this thought home with you. What you've been through often dictates what you're called to. Think about that. See, we've, we've got it backwards. 
We've turned our problems and struggles into all the reasons why God can't use me. And he's saying, no, no, no. This, I'm putting together a list of how I can. And, and I started thinking about my own life. One of the only things I knew growing up was I wanted to be a dad because I didn't have one. And then I couldn't wait to be a dad. I couldn't wait to be a dad. And then Jill got pregnant with our first son, and I got scared to death. So all of a sudden, Satan started whispering lies. How are you going to be a dad? You've never seen a good example of a dad. You got no experience in this field. How are you going to ever be a good dad? And then we had Ethan, and we took him home, and nobody gave me a handbook. But here's what I've learned. I'm a better dad. I don't have the knowledge of visual aids, but I've got a desire in my heart that I want to be a good dad, and I try to be a good dad, so much so because I didn't have a dad that now I'm a better dad than I think I ever would have been because I went through some pain back here. It adds to my purpose over here. I'm just telling you, it was a real struggle. I think I'm a better dad because of some pain I went through. I'm good at talking about experiencing the grace of God. I'm not eloquent. But I'm good at connecting with people about talking about the grace of God. Why? Because I've made a whole bunch of mistakes and needed it. I'm good at talking to people about suicidal thoughts. Why? Because I've had them. I'm good at feeling people's pain, and I used to not be. I used to be very just rough around the edges. And people would complain about life, and all I could think of was like, man up. Like, I had no, like, empathy. But see, now I've been through some things. You've been through some things. And it changes us. And now I can feel your pain in a way that I never used to be able to because I've been through some things, right? Ask anyone who I'm close to. Ask my family and my close friends. I am a ferocious protector of the people I love. I will fight to the death if you try and hurt somebody I love. Why? Because I've been through some abuse. That struggle makes me better at what God's called me to. It's just true, isn't it? I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about the things you've been through. Some of the things you've been through, you've made a list of reasons why they disqualify you from God doing really cool things in your life and through your life. What if you flip that right side up and went, no, I got a real long resume of the kinds of ways that God can use me. Maybe you've been through a painful divorce and in your mind you went, God can't use me because I've been through something like that. What if you flip that around and went, no, I know what it feels like to go through a painful divorce. So I'm going to go into my world and find somebody who's struggling with a painful divorce and I'm going to show them the love of God because I know how bad it hurts. My past addiction isn't a reason why God can't use me. It now makes me one of the best people in the world to talk to somebody struggling with addiction because what I've been through makes me better at what I'm called to. He doesn't want to use us in spite of our brokenness. He wants to use us because of it. And I just want you to see this. It's going to be your story. Genesis 50, 20 is going to be your story. You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. If you can start to embrace this and go, yeah, I got some stuff in my past and I got some stuff that Satan tried to take me out with, but I serve a God that flips things right side up. And so what Satan thought he'd take me out with now is going to make me better at what God's calling me to do. And I'm going to go change somebody's world today. I have, I feel like I have been living this the last three years in such a way that I just didn't see coming. Uh, if this is your church, you know my story over the last three years very well. If it's not, in 2019, I actually had to take several months off work because I was having such bad panic attacks, I couldn't function. And uh, I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to come back. And I remember, and I shared this story two and a half years ago, I was talking to my counselor right before 2020. I was about to come back in January of 2020, which, you want to hear something funny? He goes, hey, it's, it's beginning of 2020. When you, when you come back to work, we're going to reintegrate real slow. No stressful things. No big changes. <laughs> Apparently, he didn't know COVID was coming, did he? So I'm talking to him in his office, and I said, man, I said, um, I said, 
I don't think I can go back. I'm not ready. He said, why? Why aren't you ready? And I'll never forget. I said, I mean, I'm not fixed yet. But what I'm saying is everything we feel. Of course, I want to be used by God to do some big things. I just feel too broken. He goes, he goes, Sean, whose church is it? I said, it's God's church. <laughs> he goes, Sean, he's got a little iPad. Whose church? I said, it's God's church. He goes, all right, let me ask you a question. Now, I'm talking about my profession and my life and my calling. I want you to think about your life and your calling. Listen, he goes, if you were God, who would you want running Red Rocks Church? Would you want the guy who's got life so put together, doesn't hardly struggle with anything, just thinks he's got everything whipped? He's got it so put together that he like barely ever needs to even lean on you? Or would you want the guy that's so broken that he knows his only shot is to lean on you every step of the way? He goes, who would you want running that church? And I was like, you know, I think I'd want the broken guy. And he goes, yep. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, Sean, God only uses broken people because what other kinds are there? We're all broken. But somehow we in our mind create this scenario that I can't be used because I'm broken. And God's going, no, you're the only kind of people I do use. If you think you're super smart and got everything put together, you should be scared. Read the Bible. Look at the screwed up people he used to do everything. It's almost like the more screwed up you are, the more I can do with you. Right? And I remember, I remember being in this counseling facility in 2019. And I remember thinking, there's no way I can be a pastor again. Like, I'll serve at a church. I'll serve at this church. I love this church. I'm just too screwed up. And then I had this talk with my counselor, and I was like, all right, I'll try. Came back here, and in January of 2020, told you guys, I'm not going to pretend I'm not broken, but I'm going to do my best to lead, even though I'm broken. And then I felt called to write this book about anxiety. Same thing. I can't do this. I'm still too broken. I felt like God wanted me to do it. What I'm about to share with you is not me bragging about anything. If you know me, like I'm, I got a whole bunch of defects. Thinking I'm all that is just not one of them. But I want to share with you what happens when we decide to go, God, yes, I'm broken. And I choose to trust you and walk in my calling at the same time. I got this message. Carson sent me this yesterday. I change. I'm going to leave out some of the information and I won't say any of the names. Good morning. My name is, and I need to let Pastor Sean know something. I have a daughter that is 12. Whew, sorry. I have a daughter that is 12 years old. Her first suicide hospitalization was when she was 10. She's been plagued with debilitating anxiety and depression from age six due to a traumatic event she experienced. We've been fighting to help her through it. She's been struggling with thoughts and voices that keep telling her to kill herself and feelings of worthlessness. And three days ago, I stumbled across a message from Red Rocks Church talking about his book, Attacking Anxiety. We watched him pour his heart out on stage. We cried with him, and I asked my, my daughter to watch it with me. In one sermon, she broke, and she told me, Mom, someone else understands that's what happens when you share your brokenness. It's what happens when we stop being so embarrassed about what we've been through and going, no, let me share it. Because somebody's going to go, I understand. Somebody else understands. She spent the last three days scouring YouTube, watching sermons and opening up to me more than she has in years. I know God led these sermons to my daughter to help her through these struggles. We're fighting against her depression and anxiety. But please, Somehow tell Pastor Sean and Red Rocks Church from this small family in, they tell us where they're from, that your church message is reaching a 12-year-old girl who wants to die and helping her see the reason to fight. Red Rocks Church, your messages 
have been an answer to a very desperate prayer. I know God is leading my daughter to her purpose and she is fighting. Thank you for being bold and real. Your church messages are reaching the hopeless of God and God is using them to give hope once again. My daughter's name is, and she once again has hope. God bless you and Red Rocks Church. That's what happens. That's what happens when we stop being so embarrassed about all our struggles and go, no, I'm human. Yeah, I made a bunch of mistakes. I got a bunch of pain. But that's not the end of my story because I also have a really good God. And if he can get me through this, he can get you through this. And because of what I've been through, I'm going to be better at what I'm called to. Listen, church, Paul got to a point of going, not only will I stop hiding all my struggles, I've learned to actually start to brag about them. I've learned to actually start to go, I look forward to certain struggles in my life because I know it means God's setting me up for something great. He says this, he said, he was asking God to take a struggle away. And each time God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in the insults, in the hardships, in the persecutions, and in the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Listen, this message is not in my heart just to make you feel better about yourself today. I want you to feel better about yourself today. But you've heard us say it too many times. We exist to make heaven more crowded, and that can't just be a poster on a wall. It's got to be the way we live, church. And we can't do that unless we start to become an army of people so confident in our calling that I'm willing to embrace my struggles and go share them with the world and go change one person at a time. We can do this. There's a lot of horsepower in this one little local church. <clears throat> we don't do membership because we're not a country club. I'm not looking for members. I'm looking for some fighters. I'm looking for some people that say, I'm not just part of this church as I show up and watch things. No, I'm a part of this church and this mission. And let's go take our life and humbly submit it to God and let him go change the world through us. That's what I want to do. That's what I want you to experience. Would you stand up with me at every single location? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that you're speaking. <clears throat> I thank you that you're encouraging some of us right now, that you're emboldening some of us right now, that some weights are being lifted off of our shoulders right now. I don't have to be embarrassed of what's happened. My God will turn it around and use it for good. I want to ask for two responses today. With everyone's eyes closed, I just want to ask two questions. I want to give you a chance to respond to what God might be doing in your life. Number one is this. You go, I have had some struggles either in my past or my present, and today I make my prayer. God, help me to use what I've been through to go change the world. If that's you, raise your hand. I'm just going to pray that that's going to happen. Come on. Second question is this. You say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. Oh, I want what you're talking about. I want forgiveness of my sins. I want his spirit living in me. I want him to use me to go change the world. And I want heaven forever. And today I just realized it starts with me saying yes to Jesus. And you just know it like today's my day. This is my moment. I want him to forgive my sins. I want to make him Lord of my life. I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. If that's you and you know it right now, raise your hand at every single location. Raise him up. Come on, Brussels, Texas, raise them up. No matter where you're watching online, you can hit those buttons, you can respond to what God is doing. God, I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that you are speaking. I thank you that eternal lives are being changed right now in Jesus' name. And God, I pray you help us, every single one of us, to begin to embrace how you've created us. Embrace the struggles we've been through. Hold our head up high and walk into our calling with some God-given confidence in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's worship.